Welcome to Esports in 30, the FPS edition. This is the show where we get to dive a little deeper into the esports genres of your dreams. And many of us here at the office tend to gravitate toward the CSGO scene. That's exactly what Zurich and I are going to be getting into today with the help of a very special guest. But Zurich, I want you to tell the people watching a little bit about yourself before we get into them highlights. So I'm usually, yeah, in the background. I'm never in this in this space. But I do love the FPS scene. I love CSGO. It's mm -hmm. like one of my very first games. Don't look at my Steam account. I have a I'm disgusting amount of hours on it. I know, you're top tier. But you're top tier in a lot of different first-person shooters. Like, it's not yeah. just CSGO. It's, also, like, you're, yeah. you're the guy in the office that's the best at Fortnite. You're the best at, really, like, Apex. You won't even squat up with some of us because you're too good. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, I know. I pretend like Tyler I'm tries. offline. Yeah, I, exactly, I, yeah. you pretend like you're offline. That's yeah. really rude, Zarek. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, like that's... Like, he's too good for all of us. <laughs> that, that That's just the nature of it. Sometimes, you know, you... you yeah, I like winning. I like winning. Like Astralis. <laughs> like Astralis. Nice <laughs> segue because we're going to dive into all that. I am going to be say may have played out a couple weekends ago, but the results and drama are still fresh in our minds. And well, straight up, we want to relive the magic. And so without further ado, to the highlights. How close as it is. Utility thrown in, flash dodge, didn't it goes for exactly the play that was called out to free. Oh! Yeah, they both and it's seven to nothing. Back taps the bomb, no one is even within position to hear it. Nico's still so far back, being cautious, but he just be all oh, automatic. That is incredible. This could be all she wrote for Liquid. 20 seconds left, and Ali chips in for a third and a fourth. Heads have done it. They pulled off the upset. Towards inside is Simpo. Oh, oh, what the hell? God. To come out from jungle, watch it, because he's got the lineup simple. He doesn't have the time. He's got to go to the AK and get the kill. Oh. This guy is on another level. He's going to have time to put the ball down. And X7, he knows he's in rotation to flash out. He's got the information. He's got just enough. He goes back to the AWP. But is that what's going to cost oh. him? It is. It is going to cost him. And then he plays down on the bench. Yes, he can. Alexi B caught napping. We're gonna bullet perforating through his head. Now this does give Liquid a chance. They do have control of Bob and now has found himself killing X7. It's breathing down his neck, smoking to get deployed onto the site and try and skew the vision. Oh, what a flick onto Sergey that is! Now Nafly gonna use that smoke to his advantage, just pulls back to the van. Waiting, anticipating an Alu push. He comes through the shadows! Oh, that's ineffable from that fly! Left alone now, three versus one. Surely it's where we see them get around on the board. If he gets the bomb denied here, oh my goodness. He actually has a chance here. This is unbelievable. Oh one versus one now! That is so sick from Sergey. He'll get two. They walk in the smoke, Glaive. He'll only punish one, but it's just aerial of five, and it's done! <laughs> Intel Extreme Masters, champions, majors, back to back! Astralis again! It's out of it! Ooh, goosies every single time. Now, the Major gave us a lot to digest, so joining us today, we have the one, the only, Jason Moses O'Toole. How are you? Uh, I'm good. That might have been the most uh, hype intro <laughs> I've ever received in my entire career. There's, I liked it. There's I'm, no way that is real. There's no way that's I'm real. I'm going to bring you to all the events and you can just open up for me everywhere I go. Listen, I'm happy to be there, uh, especially with the cast and crew you guys have got going. Congratulations on such a fantastic event. You guys kept Amazing. us entertained. I mean, obviously the players, the plays, like all of that was fun to watch, but it was because They're not the of you. Ones. I mean, exactly. It's because of you. Honestly, every time, I'm not to pump your tires here before we get going, but every time Moses is on the mic, I jump for joy because the way he describes everything that's going on, I feel like I don't even need to know CS. It's just like he's got it figured out. So amazing analyst, the best. Moses. Appreciate you are, that. Yeah, something special, man. Uh, so let's dive right into it here because we need to talk about the Astralis dynasty. Um, let's just, I mean, as a caster watching this stuff, as an analyst watching this stuff, like what runs through your mind when you see Astralis take the stage? Uh. It's it's so weird because it's gotten to such a point where we obviously all as as the casters and analysts and, and even I, I think the, the players that have to compete against them all really love watching Astralis play because they do the game itself such a service. They play it in such a solid 
um, solid way. There's no gimmicks to it. It's just, it's, it's just, you know, beautiful Counter Strike. The way that it's played over, you know, it's probably some of the most beautiful Counter Strike we've seen played in the 20 year existence of the game and, and the competitive nature of the game. So, um, I think all of us very much appreciate the things that Astralis does. But on the other hand, I, you know, I've, I've made a couple of jokes about this in the past. It has gotten to the point now where everyone starts predicting against them because everyone wants to be there when like they finally fall they've had such a long period of domination and no one sees it coming there's no way to kind of tell when it's going to happen but everyone wants to be that guy who gets it right when someone eventually does beat them so um you know if you ever watch a segment or a show with us just realize there's no reason to ever predict against astralis we just do it because we want to be able to say haha gotcha or you know be able to have one up on our on our colleagues as well um just because they're they're winning like clockwork and they're making it look easy. Uh, do you think that Zonic had a lot of um, impact to their um, success in the past year? Oh yeah, I mean Zonic at this point you have to consider him to be like one of the one of the best coaches we have in Counter Strike, and I mean I would say this in my my own kind of ignorance of some of the other esports and figures, which you know I guess in a way I probably shouldn't say, but but screw it. Um, I would say he's got to be one of the best coaches in all of esports um, with, with you know the dynasty that he's been able to help develop for this team um, and the, the way that he's having them play and kind of the input that he has. He's one of the first coaches that I know of in Counter Strike where he's had uh, he's been able to be very hands-on and have direct input when it comes to you know cutting and picking up certain players in the past so um he's he's perhaps the most hands-on coach that we have you know other names that come to mind is someone like zeus who's down with the brazilians and mibr but um but certainly zonic deserves an equal amount of praise and credit as do his players and and to his credit his players give him that credit as well so it's not just from the outside looking in i mean so does the astralis website because they say about zonic and i quote the best coach in the world on the best <laughs> team in the world zonic has more time titles to his name than most with a unique and personal style to his coaching. He's mm -hmm. taken Astralis to a completely new level of Counter-Strike, <laughs> so you must well. agree. Yeah, well, you're not going to put on your website, oh, like, our coach is the third <laughs> yeah. best one out there, so th thanks for all the hard work you put in. Uh, but no, but I, I think Zonic has is unique in, in certain ways um, in the sense that, you know, he was a championship caliber player, you know, over a decade ago when he was competing in the early versions of Counter-Strike when, when it wasn't this big. 1.6. Um, he's, mm. yeah, he's been part of some of those historic lineups. He's a father of, I think, two or three, so he's got a little bit of experience and age and wisdom under his belt that most so, you know, the 19 year old, you know, headshotters that come in won't have. Mm -hmm. um, he's got a lot of obviously a little bit more patience built into his life uh, uh, and, and experience of coming from the bottom and getting to the top as well. So, I mean, there, there's a whole lot of things that give him advantage over his colleagues in the coaching realm. Um, and it's just really cool to watch him and the rest of the team take advantage of it in such an impressive fashion. No kidding. Um, so what do you think about the finals? Uh, a lot of people kind of called <laughs> it as a kind of a boring finals, I uh. guess. But I mean, Astralis just swept everybody in that entire yeah. tournament. And, you know, Ents was kind of, we're going to talk about them a li in a little bit. But, yeah. uh, you know, they were almost there, but <laughs> uh, not quite. Did you, did you guys see it as boring at the desk? Like, honestly. Um... Uh, no, because it had, uh, you know, Ents won over so many fans throughout that r run. And, and the feeling, I think maybe for a viewer at home, it might have come off a little bit boring. Mm. But being in the arena for those three days leading into the grand final and then the two quarterfinal days um, and then the semifinal day, there were so many Ents fans cheering and everything like that. So even though it was, it was very one-sided in terms of the gameplay, like it was, it was a fun environment to be in because Ents had really, you know, I tweeted this out during the event, I'd never seen a team win over a crowd of any kind the way that Ents won over that Katowice crowd. Um, so that that was just a fun experience to, to be a part of. Um, I mean, looking at the game itself, I think it was pretty obvious there was there was no real chance that Ents was going to be able to take Astralis. Now, we all said the same thing about the majority of Ents' games and run up to that point. Um, but I think Astralis, I think teams the first time they play Astralis are just always going to have a hard time because it's a completely different level, a completely different style than what they're, they're, they've experienced. And that was the first time Ents played Astralis in a live tournament setting. So um, all, everything, was, everything was stacked up against them. Which, I mean, nerves, number one, just being on that stage. They had already done so well up until that point, Ents. But uh, before we dive even further into Ents' amazing Cinderella story, I do want to kind of put a bow on Astralis here because this really does seem to be the team 
like this dynasty team that no one can really climb to. They have figured out this meta and made it work for them. And I don't understand why teams haven't, other teams haven't figured it out yet. They've seen them play for a while now. So what do you think they need to do to catch up? Uh, I, I don't even think it's necessarily a, a trend of Astralis just mm -hmm. having figured out this specific meta. I think with Astralis, I think the, the, the issue that most other teams have is Astralis just plays the most mistake-free and fundamental Counter-Strike there is. Um, you know, they, they are a team where they don't take any... They don't try and like take any shortcuts. Like normally, you know, if you're if you're a professional team, and I mean, this is, should obviously never happen, but it does when you have one of those rounds where you're going up against opponents that just have pistols and they don't have a lot of money to invest. You kind of, you know, take your foot off the pedal and you relax. Um, if you're going up against that kind of a buy, or if you're the team with that buy, and you say there's there's no real point of trying. Maybe just get a couple kills. Their goal in every round is to win, and they play every single round like a gun round. So even if they're only equipped with pistols, they're still playing it smart and just seeing what happens. Um, and it's and it's really small details like that. It's never just like the one detail that's going to get you over the hump. But when you add like six or seven of those details across the 30 rounds of a game that they have an advantage over their opponents, obviously something's going to build up and um, they, they just play as mistake free as you can get. And so they're able to punish everyone else's mistakes. Mm. OK, so let's jump over to and back into it. Back into the story um, Yeah, so this was their first major, well, for, for the players, mm -hmm. uh, it was their very first major. Mm -hmm. Again, the nerves and everything, sure. you know, and yeah. uh, Alu just got the baby. He just uh, yes. got a baby. He just got a baby. <laughs> he just got a baby. So that probably <laughs> added to some of their, um, I don't know, it's like Excitement. the- Yeah, yeah, the baby yeah. buff, the, 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 dad, the dad buff, you know. The dad buff, I love um, it. So, uh, like they have been resilient for the mm -hmm. for most of their for most of their matches, sorry, mm -hmm. and they've won. I mean that incredible run, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Did you think that Ens was more of just a hot streak, or mm -hmm. were they actually, you know, like surgically yeah. just going into each game, like they know what they needed they know to what's do? Up, yeah. I think I think it's a combination of a couple of things. Obviously, there, there's a little bit of a hot streak effect. Although, I mean, again, this is the major is an event now that's three weeks long. So, mm -hmm. you know, even if you go on a hot streak, that can only last you so long, right? That, by nature, a streak is a very short period of time. So, what we saw in London was Liquid went through a hot streak in the group stage, and they got absolutely demolished once they got into the playoffs. Happened again here as well, by the way, with Team Liquid. But um, for Ents, you know, remember they they started out. The best thing that could have happened to them, they started out the uh, the Legend stage 0-2, and, and they had to fight their way back from 0-2, and, and they had to win three best of threes in a row. And I, I think if they didn't have to go through that experience, I don't think they would have necessarily been prepared for the stage, because they actually did not look good when this event started. Um, a lot of people had predicted them to get into the top eight. A lot of people had predicted them to get in the top 16. Um, and, it, it, you know, both of those things looked really, really sketchy for a certain period of time. So I think part of it is, yeah, maybe Maybe, maybe they had like a little bit of a heater there towards you know one second once they got into the playoffs. Um, I, I think being at a major and having to grind all those games back just to make it into the top eight gave them some experience together in high pressured scenarios that allowed them to withstand the pressure of the stage. I think you have a situation where this is a team that not a lot of teams had researched coming into this event because no one even knew if it'd be worth the time looking into them with any kind of a detail. Um, I think it was a you know certain amount of that was going to be certain players over performing x7 came into this event as a player who no one really thought was going to amount to anything he was kind of like considered their weakest link um he had he had, who's probably one of their best players at this event their in-game leader had spectacular calling uh, alexi b who was very clutch as well so they had a lot of things going right all at all at one moment um and much like we doubted them every step of the way, it, it always kind of sucks because now you're at this point where Ents was so much fun to watch and so impressive, mm -hmm. but you have to doubt him one last time and say, can you make it happen at future events? Was this just like a one-off event at the major? Are you going to be deadly into the events we have coming up? They're going to be in Brazil next week, so mm -hmm. we're, we're going to find out pretty quick. Well, I mean, I have to ask you then, what's your opinion on that? How do you feel like they're going to fare? <laughs> oh, they're throwing the bus at me, I see. I am. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm not sure. I don't I don't think we'll see I don't think their next event or two is going to be like the same kind of a run as as the major of getting all the way to the grand finals. And, mm. and I, I think we'll still see some impressive things out of them. I don't think we're going to be seeing them like, you know, do any kind of deep dive into the top four. I expect, you know, we'll, we'll watch them have some dangerous runs at events in the early stages of 2019. Um, and honestly, if I had to guess, I would say there will probably be one one roster change, I think, by the end of the year for Ents. Mm. OK, so not so easy for Ents. 
Uh-huh. No, it's not going to be, you know, the meat <laughs> magic has been used up in Katowice, so I don't, you know, yeah. see how it goes. I was in there. I was using the hashtag. I was so excited. You guys had me so hyped. They had me of so, just, were. right? It was just so much fun. And I love, <laughs> who doesn't love a good underdog story? It yeah. was just, uh, you And that know. song's a banger, Easy for Ends. Right, okay. And yeah. they use it for the intro. <laughs> how amazing is that? I was, I, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, that All was fun. Together. That was good. All right, uh, let's move on to yes. FaZe, mm. who also, uh, unfortunately, fell to... Uh, ends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, are they just that unreliable as a unit, or is mm-hmm. it more like the, maybe the pressure of the event? What do you think? With FaZe Clan? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, FaZe is a team where they're, they're, always, they're always fun to talk about because, like, no matter how bad they look, they have the players and they have the capability of just kind of flipping a switch and, and, and winning a game. I, I think the biggest problem with FaZe is. Um, at the moment, you're going to see with with YNK coming in as the coach, who's you know former form analyst on the broadcast, and then you know he coached in my BR as well for about six months or so. Um, with him coming in, I, the goal has got to be number one consistency. You can't have a team in this day and age, especially like Phase, especially with the names on that on that roster. You can't have a team that's going to come in and place you know top four, and then the next event they're going to you know bomb out in group stage. We've seen this Phase team be very up and down. Um, and part of that is because they have all this star power and star branding on this team, they do kind of play a loose style that feels very individual at times. They seemingly at times get lost in terms of how exactly they want to play the game. And then it just looks ugly. Um, so so priority number one for FaZe um, is, is going to be finding some consistency, finding a little bit more of structure to how they want to attack um, on their offensive sides and how they want to defend and kind of, ha- you know, improving the communication. And those are the things that, like, aren't really that sexy and they take time. And the really the really crappy thing about it is you're probably going to see some kind of a dip for in the short term, maybe just a month, maybe just two months. But they have to take that kind of hit right now so that, you know, in three, four months' time, by the time the next major is rolling around, they can at least see if they play Counter Strike the wrong way, if they can make this work, because you know they're they're gonna come up to a crossroads pretty soon of whether this you know is it a stylistic issue or mm-hmm. is it a roster problem, and they've and they've kind of started to exhaust all the options if you want to take the stylistic route. So next up is going to be looking at the players on the team and seeing who they want to replace and who they want to bring in. I feel like they would just get a lot of pressure from their org in general because they just had. I, I just feel like they're a money team. They have a lot of money behind these guys, a lot of pressure behind these guys, and just falling short has got to just be devastating for them as a team. Yeah. I mean, with the coach, I just like. Do you do you see them after these matches? Do you talk to them? How are these guys feeling? Uh, I mean, like like all competitors. I mean, I, Nico is one of the fiercest competitors I know. Same with Olaf Meister throughout his career. So I mean, those guys are obviously are crushed. And I, I know Yanko personally, one of my good friends from from the analyst crew and the broadcast team. Um, you know, he hates losing pretty much more than any any player I know. Um, so I, I mean, there, there's a lot of guys on that team that are putting in a lot of work, both individually and on a team scale, to do better. I, I think the entire idea of Phase is a money team. I think it, it, it was certainly accurate when this team was put together, but I, you know, I think quietly, kind of as things have gone on, they've kind of you know framed that back in. You know, and so I mean, they're not as much about splashing the pot. You know, they're not going to go out and make one of those big, high-profile signings because they already did that for the four players they currently have contracted to be full-time members of this team. So. Um, no need to kind of go out and do that anymore, in my opinion. But here's the thing. As long as they're getting invites, which they will because they have such star billing, mm-hmm. as long as they're getting automatic invites to the events and don't have to go through the online qualifiers, I think they're going to be they're kind of going to be happy. You're getting your exposure. You're going to be at all the biggest tournaments of the year. Obviously, you want to go deep. But, you know, in Counter-Strike, with the way the scene operates, you don't really hit that kind of critical emergency level until you stop getting direct invites. Fair. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next team, uh, which I guess most people consider as the best NA team uh, in Team Liquid, obviously. Yep. And there's obviously only one question to ask oh. is do we the right choice? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that remains to be seen. I, you know, that's going to take a couple events and a little bit of time to kind of um, get a proper read of that roster change. Mm. I personally really like it. Um, I, I think this is the best roster that this team, or that any NA team has ever assembled. That includes the, the Cloud9 lineup that won the major. I think this lineup is um, is, is better in many ways. Um, and I think eventually they'll prove that. Um, the, the tough part is obviously at the major, they breeze through the group 
group stages and that they get upset by ants in the quarterfinals which is rough um and i it's it's hard because obviously it's super disappointing for a team that's supposed to be going deep that was supposed to be in the grand finals mm. um that's supposed to be one of the main rivals for astralis especially but it's hard to you know I, that that looked more like an off day maybe maybe an off day in terms of you know a new player coming in gonna change up the way you do certain things and maybe they just weren't comfortable an off day individually where players didn't seem to be stepping up naf who's usually very consistent had had a terrible series in that so it's hard to kind of you know hit the hit the the world as or the sky is falling on team liquid after just kind of like one day of where we saw them play a bad series it just happened to be at the biggest tournament of the year mm. it just happened to be at one of the world championships and, and that that sucks but um you know it's just as you kind of stay measured when stewie comes into this team and you know mm. when they upset astralis at i by power stay measured that's not like indicative of things to come and it's the same when they do poorly here at katowice in my opinion um, I do. We do need to move on and, and talk a little bit about meta here because uh, obviously there has been a shift recently. But can you talk about the impact of the AUG meta on this tournament? Yeah, obviously it was pretty, um, I mean, no one kind of knew it was coming. They had mm -hmm. the break to kind of play with it, um, and then everyone started to realize how powerful this AUG was. Um, I think the biggest impact that it has is it gives counter-terrorists uh, a little bit of flexibility and an option to for a weapon to use when they don't necessarily have utility. Um, the way the game works in, in kind of um, rewarding aggression and awarding the peaker um, meant that when you have an M4 with no name, you're kind of just holding and watching an angle but the advantage is with the offensive player who's turning that quarter and actually trying to initiate the fight. So with the AUG, with the scope, with the accuracy and the damage it can do so quickly, it negates that kind of peeker's advantage over to the aggressor. So the AUG is much more capable of just sitting and holding the angle, which means that the terrorist players and the offensive players have to be a little bit more honest about how they attack a certain part of the map. You have to use a flashbang. You can't just swing wide and take a dry peek the way that we've seen so many players do over the years. So I think it helps in that sense. Um, it just is a little bit ridiculous with with how often the AUG is purchased because of the money um, yeah. which they just which they just fixed with the uh, the update that came out yesterday so hooray are you excited about this update uh no okay <laughs> no, hot I mean, take I think I think it's a good update, obviously. I think the AUG fix is needed. We'll see if it maybe needs to even get... The, the price might need to get raised again. Mm. I think the big, the biggest worry for me is they also changed the way the economy system worked. Mm -hmm. I haven't had time to mess with it, and I haven't had time to kind of watch how those games play out. Um, but I'm always super skeptical of any changes to the economy system because mm. it's such a fragile beast. Once you start yeah. messing with the money... Um, you can have real big unintended consequences. And this was a huge change to the economy system. So only time's going to tell how it plans out and how the teams decide to kind of mess with it and, and change the way that they approach the economy and the mm -hmm. money situations. But, um, you know, just looking at it on paper it does scare me a little bit. Uh, Moses, we're almost out of time with you, unfortunately, today. But we have a few quick fan questions for you before we let you go. Uh, this one is from Gunglio on Twitter. He asks, what roster moves should Navi make to get better tacti oh, tactically rather than firepower-wise, ignoring how simple or flamey would work in the system? Uh, I'm not going to lie. I actually really, it depends. I really like the Navi that we saw at the major with their current lineup. You know, if we're going to get that Navi event in, event out, I think that's one that's going to be, I mean, obviously they got to top four. Um, they look much better than the Navi that we saw in the past few months. So for my money, if that's the Navi we get at every single event, I don't want to see a single roster change. But, you know, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> we have a second fan question for mm -hmm. you. Anders, ask <laughs> Anders, if you stand by some train tracks that fork up ahead, and on the one set of tracks are all the people who comment at, on HLTV and on the other, the people who try to engage in political discussion in the comment sections of YouTube videos that don't have anything to do with politics at all. And you can decide which way the train goes, which do you choose and why? Which, which track is Anders on is the question that I'd have to ask first. That's fair. <laughs> we're, sending it, we're sending it right in that direction, whichever, whichever side he's on. I love that. He lobs the ball to you. You love it right back. <laughs> Moses, thank you so much for joining us and helping us look back on what was truly a phenomenal major. Of course. Anytime. Thanks for having me again. All right, Derek, we only have a few minutes left to chat. As per our title, Esports in 30, we have to actually stay within 30 minutes. Unfortunately. Tyler. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. So I want you to actually tell me who your favorite player was of the tournament. All right, so yeah. the, my 
favorite player of the tournament, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, not statistic-wise per se, but more as just like the sheer CSGO passion mm. is Dupree. Mm. Because, you know, leading up to the, I mean, during the majors, unfor unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, he lost his father yeah. and he still showed up and still dominated the scene. And I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if you saw Carmack's speech in the beginning where he was just like, CSGO is all about, you know, the passion. It's not, it's not about the money. It's never been about the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's 2019 now, so now everybody's getting paid the big bucks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, back in the day, like, they were just playing for the sake of, you know, winning. Yeah, of course. And not, there wasn't even as much viewers as there, there was now. So oh it was God, just like, we all just played. I mean, they all just played to play. Yeah. And Dupree just, you know, showed that, that passion. It, I mean, it was passion. so real. And like his emotions afterward were so real. I was definitely, I got really misty eyed when he did his post game mm -hmm. uh, interview as well. He just has that. He has that. He's just like to me. This is what an athlete is. Like mm -hmm. they come in, they compete, they do whatever they can to win. Mm -hmm. And he really showed up, man. Like to have that emotional loss, like he did, and to still come up and show up and be there for his team because he mm -hmm. knew that his teammates needed him. They have to continue this run. The pressure of having a dynasty on his back is something so real. And I just feel like now he is king, and we can call him the king of all of this. Like even watching that, I don't know if you saw that advertisement with him and um, Doctor Disrespect, like yes. the whole astrology. That, that's and that's a very, very good skit. Right, yeah, to have yes. that come out after. I just feel like it all kind of worked in their favor. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, sometimes life hands you a bad card. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you um, to figure out how to play that card to that's your right. advantage, right? So um, he definitely did that. I'm just so proud of this team. I'm so proud of him. Uh, CSGO, to me, honestly, just feels like it's at it's reached this next level. Um, I want more people to get involved. I do want to know in chat, though, if you are a CSGO fan, please just give us, like, throw some ones up in the chat so we know that you are interested in CSGO, you want to see more CSGO. And Zerg and I are also going to be talking about different FPSs, obviously. And this BRs, is the all the BRs, all the FPSs. It's all going to be here on Fridays, every That's right. Friday. That's right, every That's Friday. Right. So, but my concern is though, how much BR are we going to be doing? Is it going to be heavy on Fortnite or more heavy on Apex? I want to know if people <laughs> actually want to see, like, I do want to know if you guys want to see some Fortnite news. If you're kind of over Fortnite, if you're burnt out with Fortnite, that's okay. Some of us in the office are. I feel like, Zerk, you're a little bit burnt on it too. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I, I mean, I don't think the game is, was really designed for it to be competitive. I think mm. Apex is more designed to be that way, especially yeah. with how they're patching it and everything. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Um, coming up, there's probably not going to be as much Fortnite events. There's probably going to be more Apex events because mm. it's the hot thing at the it's moment. It's hot game, yeah. yeah. So I would, I would think people would want to see more Apex Legends coming up. Um, we're also going to be talking Rainbow Six as well. I Six, do want to yeah. know uh, in chat if you are a Rainbow Six fan. If you are, please throw up some twos so we see your love because you and I need to dive into that as well. That's right. Uh, my concern is though, if Halo becomes a real thing, because we're, they're rolling on all the stuff now, mm -hmm. and we're going to be, we most likely will be covering it more. Is Brody going to be coming after this spot here? Because we all know how much he freaking loves his Halo. I'm a little concerned. It is. That this it's, might not be my show anymore. Yeah, it's like insanity almost. He loves Halo so much. I know, but uh, it's, yeah. it's a good game. It is a very good game. It's a classic it's game. And exactly. yeah, the Master Collection is coming out, and we're going to get it on PC finally. <sighs> I know, everybody's, everybody's freaking out about this PC uh, version of MCC, which is great. I'm excited for, you know, PC gamers out there. As you know, I watch people play PC. I am a console person myself. Don't hate. <sighs> don't, don't hate. It's just, it's just what I grew up on, sir. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate everything you do. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I grew up with PC. I never exactly. owned a console, so I was, I'm in the opposite spectrum of you. So that's why I'm like, yeah, console. <laughs> Controller, weird. Ugh. I mean, fine. If you're a PC gamer, uh, you should hit up Zurich. He <laughs> always pretends like he's offline, but he's online. And he's ready to squat up uh, in Apex, especially. I'm going to be playing Apex this weekend for sure because I need to get a kill or I'm gonna lose my freaking mind. I keep, I mean, it's my fault for playing support. I understand that, but I feel like I need to play support and still get a kill. Yeah. Tips? I mean, if you're playing support, you still have the same guns, Marissa. There's no excuse other than you just need to put more hours into it. 
<sighs> okay, thanks, Coach. Listen, that's all the time <laughs> we have for CSGO chat today. Thank you so much to Zurich, of course, and to Moses. And thank you at home for watching uh, next Monday. Lisa and Matt will be right back here chatting all things League of Legends. So mark it on your calendars, people. And don't forget, every day we're covering a different eSport. So you can also find us on all the social networks at Squad State to find out when. See you next time.